Christ is risen. I'm Sister Vasa, and it's Easter, and I'm having my coffee here in Vienna, in Austria. If you have been watching this show, you know that today Emilios, our Greek costume designer, has been released from jail. So we all went to the prison today. Even Anka, our Polish set designer, with baby Francis, all dressed up in his little Easter outfit. And you know, the most Shocking thing happened when Emilios came out. What? My writers don't want me to tell you about this because I'm going off script. Anyway, don't mind them. When Emilios came out, he came directly up to Anka, got down on one knee, and proposed marriage to her. As it turns out, it's a very long story, but he is the father of Anka's baby, yes. And, you know, he found out about baby Francis while watching our YouTube videos in prison. Apparently they're allowed to do that. And so he worked extra hard to behave himself in prison, so they released him early for good behavior. But Anka said that she has to think about it because she says Emilios is always getting in trouble with money, but he says he's a completely changed man and he's been begging her. Anyway, we'll see what happens with that. But I just had to share this amazing story with you because it was so remarkable, you know. On the very day when Christ liberated all of us from the prison of death and hell, on this very day, Emilios, completely a changed man, and even perhaps like a bridegroom, gets out of prison. Anyway, I couldn't think of a more appropriate story for today's episode if I made it up myself. <laughs> So, today we celebrate Easter, or Pascha, the Feast of Feasts, and we complete our transition from fasting to feasting. In fact, transition is one of the meanings of the word Pascha or Passover, because Pascha is the Aramaic form of the Hebrew word Pesach, and the word Pascha has two meanings. One is transitus, or passage, and two, passio, or passion. The first meaning of passage, or transition, derives from Israel's passage through the Red Sea, and it is compared allegorically to Christ's passage through cross, death, resurrection, and hence to our baptism, our passage, that is, through baptismal water, through Christ's death and resurrection. The other meaning of Pascha as passion derives from the slaughter of the Passover lamb in the Old Testament. This Passover lamb is interpreted Christologically in 1 Corinthians, where the Apostle Paul says, Our Pascha, Christ, has been sacrificed. Of course, we hear both these themes in the texts of our Paschal services in church. For example, at the very beginning of the Paschal canon, we say, It is the day of the resurrection. Let us be radiant, O people. Pascha, the Lord's Pascha, for Christ our God has brought us from death to life and from earth to heaven as we sing triumphant hymns. The most predominant theme, however, of the Paschal celebration in the Byzantine tradition today is that of light. Our nighttime Paschal vigil begins with a very solemn rite of lighting our candles from a candle brought out of the altar or sanctuary before we head outside the church for the procession around the church. In the Latin tradition, there is a similar rite of lighting pa the Paschal candle, and these customs arose both in East and West under the influence of the celebration of Pascha in Jerusalem, where the Paschal light or fire was brought out from the Holy Sepulchre or Tomb of Christ. In ancient sources, this rite was called Lucernarium or 
the lighting of the lamp, and it developed through the centuries into the joyous celebration we have today of the Holy Fire in Jerusalem, which attracts thousands of pilgrims to the Holy Sepulchre on Holy Saturday. The powerful symbolism of light coming from the tomb, as Christ emerged from the tomb, is repeatedly thematized in our liturgical texts. How truly holy and all festive is this saving night, how full of light, herald of the bright day of the resurrection, in which the timeless light shone bodily from the tomb for all. So the light shows bodily from the tomb, because what we're celebrating is indeed bodily resurrection. This brings us not only to the most central part of Christian faith, but also to its most radical part. <laughs> Christianity teaches not only immortality of the soul, but also, and equally importantly, the resurrection of the body. This made Christianity actually very hard to swallow for ancient Hellenistic philosophy, which, as I have told you several times already, did not have much regard for the body, nor for the material world in general. The body was considered a vessel of evil, which was feared. The ancient world feared and avoided physical impurity, and not sin, not the corruption of the will, because it was the material that was the vessel of evil, and the ancient world sought to protect itself from what it considered physical impurity, from which it believed evil comes. This was because our harmony with creation, with the physical world, was broken when we separated ourselves from God, from his spirit, who is the source of our life, and of our unity of soul and body. So death became our common and ultimate lot, beginning with Adam and Eve, as we discussed before, who first separated themselves from life and died. That is, soul and body ultimately separated in them because of their broken unity, and that meant death. And everybody followed this cycle of sin and death because as humankind, we share one nature. But you see, the state of death for body and soul to separate is not natural for us. Our original form of existence is not only spiritual. We were created as body and soul, and our physical form of existence is not only our original state, but also our eternal one. But we couldn't break out of the cycle we all fell into of sin and death on our own to get back to our natural state. We shared this weakened state of being as humankind. So even the righteous people in the Old Testament experienced the darkness of death, this unnatural state of being, so to say, of being unclothed from their bodies. But Christ, the God-man, by taking on our humanity in his incarnation, broke good news also for the body. He voluntarily took on our death because he truly died on the cross, but death could not hold him because as God, as the source of life, he injected a new strength into the humanity he shares with us. So we still die, just as he really died, but the meaning of death has been transformed because through communion with him, it leads to the resurrection of life in which we will again be united with our bodies in a new transfigured state. The new meaning of death is illustrated in the gospel with the image of the grain of wheat. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. And speaking of the grain of wheat, let's remember one simple thought for today, and that is that nothing grows in the dark. On Easter, we are surrounded with images and words and melodies about light. Let's also be sure that this light falls into our hearts and be focused on the meaning of it all, so we grow in our love, hope, and faith in him who today is indeed risen. That's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. Christ is risen. Thank you.